Before the cases are finished, Sabertech goes out of business. ValueJet is temporarily grounded by the FAA, but goes on to merge with AirTran Airways and is later acquired by Southwest. When you fly, there are so many people that affect your airplane, your safety. A DC-9 is heading from Dallas to Toronto when the cabin and cockpit are suddenly filled with toxic smoke. The electrical systems shut down, making it nearly impossible to control the plane. The captain was faced with an unbelievably difficult task. Barely able to see through the thick smoke, the pilot tries to get on the ground, but passengers are already succumbing to smoke inhalation. June 2, 1983, Air Canada Flight 797 has a normal takeoff and climb to cruising altitude, but about two and a half hours into the journey, the plane experiences an electrical malfunction. I looked at the breaker. It was out. We were allowed to one reset, so I pushed it, but it didn't move. So I didn't consider that a reset. Captain Don Cameron was at the controls that day. Just like old days. For the first time in decades, he is back in the cockpit of a DC-9 at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa. The breakers are connected to the lavatory in the back of the plane. Once they pop out, they cut the flow of electricity to the lavatory motor. The crew responded to that appropriately. There was a problem there and they left the, uh, the circuit breakers then extended or popped so that it would deprive power to that component, eliminating any potential future problem. Unfortunately, Flight 797's problems are just beginning. I think it was about an hour and a half into the flight that there was some commotion in the back of the plane. I remember seeing one of the flight attendants take a fire extinguisher to the back. Rumors began going around in the plane that there might be a fire in the trash can, that somebody might have put a cigarette out um, in the trash. The captain sends his first officer, Claude Wimet, to assess the situation. So I look back and you couldn't see the back of the airplane for sort of light blue hazy smoke. And uh, Claude came back and he said, uh, I don't like what's going on back there, I think we better go down. The pilots put on their oxygen masks and prepare for an emergency landing into the closest airport, Cincinnati. The crew moves passengers forward in the cabin to get away from the smoke, but there is little else they can do. Dropping oxygen masks to the passengers in a situation like this would do absolutely no good. The masks are designed so that they will take ambient air in and supplement it with oxygen. So even if the oxygen mask had been deployed, when you took a breath in, you're going to get ambient air in. A flight attendant empties a fire extinguisher trying to control the smoke, but can't find the source of the fire. When they opened the lavatory door, they could see smoke, but not point of origin. There was an open flame. That was behind the walls. It was in an inaccessible area. A fire behind the walls is the worst case scenario. It's almost impossible to put out or contain. Smoke was clearing and then all of a sudden I lost all my electrical power. That's when the crew realized that they had a, a, a life-threatening event on their hands. They needed on the ground as soon as they could possibly get there. Uh, Canada 797, we're on a, a main day, we're going down. Moments later, dense smoke begins to come through the cabin walls. Roger, do you have time to give me the nature of the emergency? We have a fire in the wash, in the back washroom, and it's, uh, we're filling up, uh, filling up with the smoke right now. Filled the cabin very quickly. I would say 10 to 15 minutes. It was horrible. It was so thick that you couldn't see um, your hand in front of you. You could feel your lungs and your throat burning from the sensation of of breathing in. I suggested that we put our heads lower. In firefighting school we learned that the lower you got the more that you could uh, uh, be below the smoke. With low visibility and few remaining control or navigational systems, Captain Cameron is flying almost blind. We have no heading. We have no instrument. All we have is an horizon right now. 
I would have been right up close like this with my eyeball maybe three, four inches away from the, from the window on the left side. At this point, you know, you got something serious when you got the thing lit like a Christmas tree. I didn't think about what was burning or what had happened. I just knew that something serious had happened. We can advise uh, people on the ground there. We're going to need uh, fire trucks. The trucks are standing by for you, Arcana. Can you give me a number of people and the amount of fuel? We don't have time. It's getting worse, sir. You could definitely feel when we started to descend because it was um, a real dramatic, quick decline. I definitely questioned whether or not we would make it safely to the ground. That's when my fear was probably peaked. The captain is now totally reliant on air traffic control to guide him down to the airport. Roger, you're one four miles southeast of the airport. Continue your left turn. All right, sir, President Hayden is taking you to the field. He would tell me to turn right until he told me to stop. He was faced with not being able to see his airspeed, to not be able to see what few instruments he had. Uh, it was a very difficult situation to fly. Where's the airport? 12 o'clock and 8 miles. As we came in, the airplane wanted to go faster, so it was pitching over, and then you had to stop it with a, a pull force. Air Canada 797, you are clear to land on runway 27 left. We're clear to land, we don't see the runway. After a physically demanding descent, the captain finally gets the airport into view. Here we have the airport. Four miles, I think, I saw the airport uh, in front of me. The runway was almost lined up perfectly. The landing is rough. As the plane slams into the ground, all four tires explode from the pressure. Although it was a very hard landing, um, it wasn't rocky. We came to a firm stop. But the passengers and crew are not out of danger. Coming up, as passengers try to escape the smoke, the plane bursts into flames. It looked um, like an inferno. Air Canada Flight 797 fills with smoke and loses electrical power before making an emergency landing at Cincinnati Airport. Passengers are desperate to escape the deadly fumes. As soon as it came to a stop, that's when I uh, removed the door and, and Lisa and I both went out onto the wing. But moments after the exit doors are open, the plane explodes into flames. When this additional oxygen entered the cabin, with the fire burning, it ignited that smoke. There were flames leaping out of the door and into the air, probably six to 10 feet in the air. It looked um, like an inferno. There were flames leaping out the doors. There was smoke all around it. And that's when we knew that uh, we needed to get off the wing because I knew that fuel was in those wing tanks. So. I knew that we needed to get off. As the passengers evacuate, Captain Cameron stays in the cockpit. Relying on the tank of compressed air that supplies his oxygen mask, he begins shutting down the aircraft. But before he can finish, the air runs out. I couldn't breathe. So I tore the mask off and opened the window, and I saw somebody on the wing. So I thought, good, the evacuation is going well. And then I tried to get out myself, and I couldn't move. Captain Cameron loses consciousness. Firefighters have to spray him with foam to revive him. It was ice cold and it tasted like soap. And the next thing I remembered, I was hanging from the windowsill with my right hand and I let myself go and I fell down. But for some passengers, it's too late. There were 46 people on board the plane. Half of them were killed. Of those who survived, only five were not injured. When we came out on that side of the plane, on the ground, we started talking to each other. Other people let us know that people sitting next to them had not gotten off the plane. I mean, I saw the evidence the next day in the hangar, but as far as the enormity of the deaths of that, that, that still is with me. I feel, I feel badly about that still. The way we couldn't get them all off, but we couldn't. We thought everybody was off. We thought everybody could get off because, like I said, there wasn't any screams. There wasn't uh, any noise coming from the plane. So you felt that everybody was under control and, uh, and was getting off. It was a real mixed bag of emotions. Of course, we were thrilled to have survived um, such an incredible ordeal. And to realize that some people had not survived was still 
upsetting. Immediately after the accident, investigators focus on finding the source of the fire. The investigators knew early on that they had had a fire of likely electrical origin because of the amount of damage done in the, uh, the lavatory area. The circuit breakers that popped early in the flight were connected to the flush motor on the aft lavatory, the center of the fire damage. Investigators immediately suspect an arcing event. The electricity that is flowing through a wire as over time insulation can chafe, can crack, and these cracks allow the electricity to not flow down the wire path as it's supposed to, but to jump to uh, a part of the frame of the airplane or to another wire that might be exposed. The lavatory motor is small but carries a lot of power. Weight on an airplane is something that you try to keep to an absolute minimum. And one of the ways that we do that in aircraft is to utilize very small but very powerful electric motors so that a very small motor can get three boosts of electricity as it winds around. The motor inside the lavatory is supplied with three-phase power, which is much stronger than a typical household current. Electricity jumping from one of these wires would release an enormous amount of energy and could ignite a fire. Investigators do find evidence of arcing on the left and right lavatory feeder wires, which come up through holes in the floorboards. The arc starts a fire that ignites the lavatory walls. The fire then spreads, consuming vital electrical systems, making it almost impossible for Captain Cameron to control the aircraft. It became very suddenly very hard to fly. It was nose heavy because the stabilizer trim had failed. Uh, his arms uh, would have been, been very, very, very tired by the time that he got on the ground. He had expended a lot of physical energy just to keep control of the airplane. He did a really good job. He's a seriously good aviator. Air Canada says the plane met all existing safety standards. The question now is whether those standards should be made tougher. With extensive evidence from the aircraft and detailed accounts from the flight crew and passengers, the aviation industry learns some hard lessons. Change dramatically the composition of aircraft interiors and seats to be more tolerant of a, an onboard fire condition. One additional uh, lesson learned was how important floor lighting is to aid passengers in locating ways out of the airplane, where the exits are and the path to get there. Would I get back on an airplane? Yes, I would. And especially if I had that crew, I'd be no problem whatsoever. All a fire needs to start is oxygen, fuel, and a heat source. And all three are in plentiful supply on board aircraft. The airline industry has learned hard lessons about in-flight fires. The technology and protocols developed in the wake of these tragedies have made it harder for fires to get out of control. And while smoke and fire may continue to ground flights daily, they are less likely to result in the catastrophic failures of the past. My Plane's Crash continues at the same time tomorrow. Stay tuned to National Geographic Channel for Ancient X-Files.